Hello there everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today um, during which we'll be looking at the new managing benefits guidance and the supporting qualification scheme which was launched last week. Um, Steve Jenner will be taking you through the detail of the new guidance um, but before we do that I'd just like to cover a few, um, few housekeeping things and just give a brief introduction to APMG for the benefit of those who may not know us. Um, so on your screen now you should see a brief agenda um, about what we're going to cover today. So obviously a quick introduction from me, then I'll hand over to Steve who will take you through the, the new Management Benefits Guide. Um, we'll have uh, 10 or 15 minutes towards the end of the session to answer some questions that come in. You should all see an option on your screen to submit any questions as we go or you can save those up for the session towards the end once uh, Steve's gone through the main presentation. Also, we will be making a copy of the slides and a recording of the session today available via our website, so we will send a follow-up communication to everyone that's registered, just to let you all know when that's available, um, in case anyone has missed the session today or you want to pass on the details to any colleagues and associates that may be interested. So, a quick introduction to APMG for those who may not know us. We are a Global Accreditation and Examination Institute. Um, we manage a growing portfolio of professional management qualifications, mainly around pro, uh, portfolio program and project management and IT service management, uh, which is um, with the project and program management is where this new managing benefits guidance fits in quite nicely. We accredit a global network of accredited training organizations and accredited consulting organizations, and as you should see on screen we've got over 275 of those organizations around the world now that provide the accredited training and consultancy services in support of our various schemes. Um, those schemes and products include the cabinet office portfolio of products. Some of you may be familiar with um, products such as Prince2 for project management, MSP for program management uh, and the new benefits guide that we're talking about today actually has quite strong and close links with those products. Um, we are headquartered in the UK, but we have operational offices or formal representation at least in 11 countries around the globe, including the United States, Australia, Malaysia, China and the Netherlands, to name a few. Um, and we're currently running in excess of 17,000 examinations every month around the world um, for the various products that we that we manage. Um, so for you, and if you want further information about us, just go to the website which is on the screen there. Uh, and without further ado, I will pass on to Steve, um, who will take you through the new guide. Over to you, Steve. Super, thanks, Mark. I um, hope everyone can hear me. I can't hear you, so uh, uh, it's a rather unusual situation presenting to people and actually can't even see people and can't even hear them either. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can read that. Uh, those that, uh, that know me, that's great. Those that don't, um, I've, uh, I was uh, in the civil service for, I've seen the civil service from 1999, uh, in the civil service since 1982, for God's sake. Um, uh, had some experience in uh, managing a portfolio in CJIT, CJASIT, which ended up winning an award, um, and we had got the case studies and all that kind of stuff, and uh, wrote several books. And um, I am the uh, co-author with Craig Kilford of Management of Portfolios, uh, should say portfolios there, um, and uh, the chief examiner for, for MOP as well. Uh, and now the guide, the, the author of this, uh, the, this latest guide, uh, and uh, to be the chief examiner um, as well. So, uh, Mark, if you can zip on to the next slide, please. Great. So, what are we going to cover? Okay, what, you know, why develop the guide? I think it's a, a valid point because, as we'll see, there's, there's plenty of guidance out there. Uh, what's the scope of the guide? Uh, the format of the exams? Uh, and what schedule the schedule work into it, then uh, uh, an opportunity for for you people to ask uh, questions and hopefully for me to, to to answer them. Okay, Mark. You know, the, you know, the fundamental uh, driver uh, here is that actually benefits aren't just another uh, dimension of uh, project and, and program management and even portfolio management. They are the rationale, the reason why we invest in projects and programs uh, is to realise benefits. That's the rationale for an investment of, of taxpayers' money. Or shareholders' money, we have to be able to show um, or to realise the benefit. That's the, the the whole whole objective. We don't invest, as I said to the guys at the launch event last last week. I think it was yeah, last Tuesday. Uh, we don't invest to keep our 
uh, our uh, project managers employed. We don't invest in projects to keep our suppliers uh, profitable. The fundamental driver is the realization of benefits, whether those benefits are uh, to the organization to, or to our share, our stakeholders, internal and external. Um, and those benefits being in terms of uh, increased revenue, uh, reduced uh, cost, uh, or, or benefits in, uh, in, in terms of some strategic contribution, uh, contribution to some strategic ob objective or, or a business priority, or, or lastly, to meet a legal or regulatory requirement or because we have to to maintain business as usual. So whatever the benefits are, and they, they tend to fall into one of those four primary investment objective categories, as I say, increased revenue, uh, reduced cost, contribute to some strategic objective, or because we have to, uh, that's why we make an investment. That's why benefits management is so important. I was talking to the ABM uh, portfolio management SIG yesterday, and I was saying, you know, one of the problems with portfolio management is that it's not benefits driven. And you know, one of the keys is if it's benefits driven, a lot of the problems just disappear. Um, whilst portfolio is the answer to the benefits problem, as we will see, you have to manage benefits sort of portfolio perspectives. So you have a consistent approach across the portfolio of change. On the other hand, benefits is the answer to the portfolio question. Because all the research shows that, um, uh, that uh, portfolio offices generally last about two years before they shut down. Uh, a lot of organizations struggle to get uh, uh, demonstrate a, an effective approach to portfolio management. The answer is to have a benefits-driven approach. Uh, the portfolio, as well as uh, individual projects and programs, has to be driven uh, by the, uh, the uh, benefits that uh, we seek to obtain. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. I mentioned, though, well, there is plenty of guidance out there, and we've got a few there. You've got uh, John Thorpe's rather uh, excellent uh, The Information Paradox uh, from the late 1990s. This is, I'm going clockwise, uh, moving across. This is the, the current or soon-to-be current uh, version of uh, the work from John Ward at Cranfield, uh, also Elizabeth Daniel from the Open University. Primarily John Ward's work at Cranfield, the Cranfield Approach to Benefits Management. Uh, the third one is... is um, the first book that I wrote on, on, on benefits management, that's government uh, IT. And what you get there, as you see, um, with John Thorpe, John Ward at Cranfield, uh, um, it's very much uh, IT-based. And it has to be said, until about uh, the late night of the late uh, 2000s, most of the stuff that was issued tended to be um, about IT, how to get benefits from IT. Very similar to the experience in portfolio management. Um, if you go on to the... Uh, um, go to Amazon and do a, good, do a search on Amazon for uh, various texts and books on, on, on the subject, you find a lot of it is uh, uh, traditionally was in the, the field of IT. Uh, that means, that, having said that, I mean, if you have a look at uh, John Thorpe's book, The Information Paradox, or John Ward's book, uh, Benefits Management, there's very little in there that's specific to IT. It's you know, pretty generic stuff that can be applied to uh, projects and programs more generally. Uh, and that we then see coming to fruition in Gerald Bradley's book on the right-hand side from Gower uh, about benefits realization management more generally. And then a whole load of t uh, the OGC best practice, which have a, uh, a major uh, benefit strand to them. Uh, we have MSP, uh, obviously MOP itself, as I mentioned, management of portfolios, uh, MSP being, sorry, uh, management, managing successful programs. Uh, and then lastly, uh, not least, the management of value, which clearly has a, uh, a dimension uh, uh, to it of, of benefits management. So there's a lot of guidance there, a lot of uh, existing guidance, and, and beyond that, um, people like Jed Sims in Australia, um, Alan Fowler uh, over here, and uh, Roger Davies over here as well. So a lot of texts and uh, uh, people talking about uh, uh, benefits management. The only problem being, and Mark, if you get on to the next slide, it doesn't seem to be working. As I say there, the track record... Oops. Yeah, next one, please. One. Yeah, the track record isn't good. I mean, it, the research uh, paints a, uh, a consistently poor picture. Um, this is, you know, over the last decade, uh, and it applies to a whole wide, a whole range of uh, different types of projects and programs. Most of the research initially was about IT. Um, again, this was the IT paradox that uh, John Thorpe was referring to, that everyone believes that IT adds business value, and yet all the research indicates that uh, most organizations struggle to demonstrate the, they've actually uh, realized any benefits. Um, you know, Orchard and Lou broke some quotes there from the OGC, that's for the public sector, Lavello and Kahneman, that's Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner, um, talks about manufacturing plants, uh, mergers and acquisitions never paying off. I mean, again, the research there shows that most mergers and acquisitions fail to, to realize benefits. 
the people that gain from mergers and acquisitions are the shareholders of the acquired company. It should be the acquiring the shareholders of the acquiring company that should, that should benefit. Um, and uh, new product development, new markets, new uh, uh, entry to new markets uh, fares no better, according to Kahneman uh, and uh, Dan Lovello. Uh, as Bia and Nora say, you know, 70% of all change initiatives fail, and that kind of mirrors the, uh, the quotes from uh, John Cotter. John Cotter is the uh, US uh, change management guru par excellence. He says up to 70% of change initiatives fail to deliver on the benefits they set out to achieve. I say Orchard and Lubroff in the United States say that a large proportion of mega projects fail any reasonable uh, cost benefit test. So even when we, uh, we, we bend over backwards, we still struggle uh, to demonstrate uh, a return on investment. In the world of IT, Collins and Bicknell, this is over a decade old now, but the evidence is still pretty much the same. They say not all computing projects fail, only most of them. Now and again, serendipity sees a company or government department buying and implementing a system that does as much as half of what was originally intended. And so it's that scale of, of shortfall. It's not a, a 5 or 10% shortfall of benefits. It's uh, usually quite uh, far more significant than that. Um, the implications, well, you know, the mayor of Montreal uh, said it is no more possible for the Olympics to lose money than it is for a man to give birth to a baby. Uh, he was wrong. Uh, the citizens of Montreal, uh, it took them 33 years to pay off uh, the debt from the Montreal Olympics 1976. Um, Oops, I lost my screen. Um, 1976, uh, and it meant they had the highest tax rates uh, in the intervening 33 years uh, in the uh, in the Western Hemisphere. So there are but some very very serious uh, implications of the failure to realise benefits. I mean, the upside, of course, is means there is huge potential here. As I said to the APM yesterday, and I believe I said to the um, the, the launch event last Tuesday, what this means, of course, is those that are able to. Uh, 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 to perform better, to realize more benefits, there is significant competitive advantage to be had. Okay, Mark? As I say, so research suggests things aren't getting any better, unfortunately, because you say, well, a lot of those quotes come from sort of 2003, 2004, 2005. But there's a study there by the OGC, uh, sorry, by the APM uh, in 2009, uh, sponsored by Deloitte, um, found um, a consistently poor uh, record in terms of benefits realization. Uh, there's a study there in the middle that I did for the, uh, for the OGC and for the uh, uh, for, uh, OGC within government uh, back in 2009. And then a, a study by Morehouse uh, for the Financial Times earlier this year. And what Morehouse find is they say, for example, uh, in 2009 they found uh, uh, scant, quote, scant evidence of any maturation in the discipline of benefits realization generally. Uh, success rates reported appear to represent an un unacceptable return on investment. That's this year's study, the one that you see in front of you. Um, so an unacceptable return on investment. Um, so you know, as, as, as I say, consistently uh, poor performance in terms of benefits realization, it would appear. Uh, and the evidence, when we look at it, would suggest that things aren't getting any better. Thanks, Mark. And that's because we've got a lot of guidance, and there's nothing wrong with that guidance. Uh, I'm not dishing that guidance in, in any way, shape, or form. I think it's, uh, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And it's not sufficient because we face these four, in particular, these four uh, obstacles that we need to overcome. Process is important, governance is important, but we need to overcome uh, these four obstacles if we're going to make benefits management work. Firstly, it's what Pfeiffer and Sutton in the States, the United States, refer to as the knowing doing gap. Um, they say that across, this is not nothing at all to do with project and program management, this is a, a generic issue facing management more generally. Uh, across many areas of management, we know what to do. The trouble is we don't do it. And if you see uh, the evidence of those that seek to copy, for example, the, um, the lean approach applied by Toyota, people say, you know, often people visit Toyota's factories and they come back with all the, uh, the tip sheets and they try to implement Toyota's approach and it fails. And they say because what they failed to take on board is they, they copy the process, but they don't copy the value set, the mindset, the culture, which actually breathes life into it. Um, a, uh, a study earlier this year by the APM and SEMA in Ireland uh, found that uh, uh, under half of uh, respondents described their organization's uh, approach as formal or structured, uh, and only 3% indicated their approach provides value all the time. So it will what. Whilst we're, it's, uh, there is a, a 
degree of commonality of approach in the very stuff that's been published, the John Ward, the John Thorpe, the Jed Sims, the Alan Bowler stuff, the OGC stuff on management, MSP, management of value, MOP, and so on, there seems to be people struggle to implement it in practice. Um, John Thorpe, I remember, very, very uh, uh, interesting said, uh, when all is said and done, more is said than done. It seems quite often people, we focus on the talking rather than actually the, the doing. Uh, so we've got to kind of get, get across to the, the, the doing. So overcomes knowing doing that, first of all. Secondly, uh, uh, box ticking. Um, the Morehouse study, I think in 2009, said the most frequent view is that whilst formalized frameworks are in place, they are ineffective. The trouble is that people focus on the, the stuff uh, rather than the results. And this is one of the themes of the guide at the individual project and program level, at the portfolio level, and when we look at benefits management itself, we should be driven by the benefits we seek to achieve, not the stuff that we seek we do to achieve those results. So it's kind of important that we get over, get away from people say, well, you know, we've got a business case, tick. Uh, we've got an SRO, tick. Uh, we've got a benefits realization plan, a benefits realization strategy, a benefits profile, tick to tick to tick. Uh, do you realize the benefits? No. And that's the, the, the gap that people, we, we focus on the, the stuff rather than the, uh, we focus on activities, uh, as we say in the guide, uh, act, an activity focus rather than a results or benefits driven approach. So again, so that's, uh, that's something we need to overcome, the box ticking approach, not to say those things aren't the right things to do, they can be, the problem is we need to focus on what we want to achieve. Uh, thirdly, we have cognitive bias, and this is uh, back to the work of uh, Daniel Kenneman, I mentioned uh, Kenneman. Uh, in a very famous article in the Harvard Business Review from 2003, uh, said that uh, executives suffer from delusional optimism. We overemphasize projects' potential benefits and underestimate likely costs. We spin success scenarios while ignoring the possibility of mistakes. Uh, and a whole series of cognitive biases that, that we suffer from, simple overconfidence being the, uh, the, the most powerful one of all. We just think that, uh, that we will uh, overcome all all things, the, the, uh, the World Bank did a study, they called it the E-GAP principle, uh, everything goes according to plan, we assume that if, even though we know that it never does, this time it will be different. Um, Morehouse again did a study, they found that only 10% of SROs believe that uh, business cases and benefits realization are adequately understood on programs across government and industry, however over 60% felt that uh, the understanding of their own program was okay. So in other words, the world isn't very good, but, but, we, but we, are, we, we, we will be okay. I say it's called the planning fallacy. This is not a case that we don't know projects uh, overspend, underdeliver, and come in late. We do know, we just believe that our project program will be different. Uh, even though we know in the past, it hasn't been. Um, so it's, yeah, optimism bias, a whole a series of contributions that psychologists have identified that we suffer from uh, that impact upon the way that benefits management uh, operates states quo bias, for example, being another one of the, we, it's very difficult for the inertia to, to, to give change, uh, to, to deliver change can be, can be, uh, can be difficult to achieve. Um, and uh, lastly, four, strategic misrepresentation. And actually this is based on the work by Daniel Professor uh, Ben Flupia from the University of Oxford. And Flupia says, well, maybe the, the, we are, there are these cognitive biases we suffer from. Uh, Daniel Kahneman would suggest we are delusional. Uh, we need to overcome that delusion. What, uh, what Flupia says is, well, that may be true, but from his research, he actually says um, that the, uh, the misstatement of costs and benefits in, in, in business cases is deliberate. He's, he refers to the planned systematic deliberate mistake of costs and benefits to get projects approved. And I have to say, you know, when I talk to people, people say to me, they, you know, we know exactly what we're doing. Uh, consulting firms I talk to say, well, look, Steve, we're employed to write the business case to justify the project. If we don't do it, they'll give the job to, uh, you know, Cap Gemini or uh, Ernst & Young or Deloitte or whoever. So, you know, people, uh, according to uh, Dan, uh, Ben Flubia, it's a deliberate. Um, now, whether it's delusion or deception, whether it's deliberate or whether it's delusional, it means that the, uh, the estimates, the forecasts that underpin our uh, business case are unreliable, and that then means that all future work is built on unsound foundations. So these are the sorts of uh, obstacles that we need to overcome, and these are uh, discussed in the guide, in, uh, introduced in Chapter 2, and then uh, explored in more detail in Chapter 4, and in some of the appendices where we go through uh, some of these cognitive biases 
that people suffer from. Anyone wants to read more about this stuff, I said there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff by uh, both Daniel Kahneman and Ben Flupia. Uh, worth reading the original article in the Harvard Business Review from 2003 uh, that uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote. So this is not a public sector issue; it's public and private. Um, and what we see, interestingly, is that the work now that both Kahneman and Flupia are now collaborating, and they talk about uh, the, there's a, a term called the, the conspiracy of optimism. So it's both deliberate uh, and, uh, and delusional. So we, we've got a combination uh, of both factors there. Okay, thanks, Mark. And that's why we have managing benefits, therefore. So what we're saying is, look, we, we need to look beyond uh, uh, the, the, the ways of overcoming uh, these barriers. We talk clearly about the uh, what we call the benefits management cycle, which is actually the top of the, the I was going to say pyramid, but it's the the top of the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, the building there. That we have um, a benefit cycle, which you'll see on the next slide, I think, or the slide after that, is actually a cycle. But essentially, we're saying you need to identify and quantify benefits, value and appraise them, plan, uh, realize the benefits, and review. And whilst we're saying this is a cycle. Uh, broadly, sequentially, there are and need to be um, feedback loops built in at each stage, so that it isn't purely sequential. For example, the review there we're saying is the you know not the, the fifth of the fifth of the practices in this benefits management cycle. Review actually includes, for example, start gate and what we call pre-mortems. Pre-mortems is borrowed from uh, Gary Klein uh, from the, uh, the U.S. Uh, where they say one way of overcoming some of these cognitive biases is to bring the project team together at the beginning of the, uh, the project or program and you get the project team to, um, uh, to role play and we say we, uh, we, uh, it's, it's what's called prospective hindsight, so applying prospective hindsight. We look forward, we say the project program has failed. It is one year from now, two years from now, three years from now, whatever it is, we are now in the future, the program has failed. We didn't realize the benefits. And you get the project team to kind of work out why the, the benefits weren't realized. It's not saying what might go wrong. It's saying it has gone wrong, trying to work out. So review whether it's pre-mortems, borrowing from Gary Klein, or whether it's the independent start gate. Review clearly occurring at the, at the uh, beginning of a project, during the project, with in-flight, what we call in-flight reviews, stage gate reviews, and afterwards in terms of post-implementation uh, and post-investment reviews. So the important point to make there is that these, uh, these can be seen as sequential um, stages in, uh, uh, in the benefits management cycle. On the other hand, it's really important to recognize that these, it's not a case of just waiting until the program's been deployed and then we realize benefits. We should be looking at the realized practice throughout the cycle, the same with review, uh, the same with plan. So uh, for uh, presentation purposes, five practices in the cycle, but iterative loops uh, throughout. But what we say is these five uh, practices, and there's a chapter on each of those those practices, and we go through uh, through them in detail. They will only work if we actually have the seven principles, the pillars uh, of the um, of the chart there. Uh, if these uh, seven principles are in place, so we need to uh, first of all align benefits with strategy. If we say that benefits are uh, the measurable contribution to an organizational objective, we need to make sure those organizational objectives are stated in clearly measurable terms or in ways in which we can articulate uh, the contribution that benefits make. And so, for example, we go through various techniques there um, that we introduced in MOP, but we've now explored in more detail, driver-based analysis, understanding what drives the strategy, uh, the service profit chain, the service value chain, various ways of taking the organization's business model and unpicking you know, what drives the value, what's the value chain that underpins the organization's uh, business model, and then we can align benefits to the strategy. And so we get into the guide, we go through various techniques for doing that. The second is, maybe you know, my personal view is probably the most important one of them all, and that is start with the end in mind. Uh, to borrow from Stephen Covey, he talks about begin with the end in mind, but it's going back to this point about whether we're talking about benefits management itself, or we're talking about individual projects and programs, or the portfolio. Start with what you want to achieve. Start with the benefits, and then the scope of the program should be determined by the benefits that you want to achieve. We shouldn't use benefits as a way of justifying a program or a project. That's where it tends to go wrong, where people say, well, I, I want a new IT system. Uh, how much is it going to cost? They say, you know, five million. Oh, God, we've got to find benefits of seven million. And so the game begins, or 70 million, or or 700 million, the game begins. People start searching for benefits to justify the investment. 
um, and they are therefore overstated. Start with the benefits that we want to achieve and work back from that. And uh, a technique we refer to there is the investment logic mapping approach uh, from from Australia, from Victoria, Australia. I'll give an example of that in a little while. Thirdly, utilize successful delivery methods because quite clearly, if the project or program isn't delivered, you're not going to get most of the benefits. That's not to say we have to wait till, until after delivery, um, but nevertheless, we need to have successful delivery methods. And so we're saying that disciplined delivery, whether that's using prints or MSP or alternative methods, is an absolute uh, prerequisite. But we need to apply. We live in an increasingly complex, uh, uncertain, uh, and ambiguous world. We need to have uh, to, to have more modular developments, uh, agile with a small A rather than a large A. Uh, we need to build in regular stage gate reviews, um, apply the technique of stage release of funding, so that we revisit. We don't just kind of fund something up front and then wait five years and pray to God the benefits are realised. We revisit the, the benefits uh, case on a regular basis. Um, fourthly, they're integrating benefits with the performance management regime so that we don't, I mean, it's, it's expensive to manage uh, and track benefits uh, on, on the one hand. Uh, that, that cost can be, uh, can be minimized, and the effectiveness of the system ca uh, can, be, uh, can be optimized where the benefits measures align with the organization's performance management regime. And so that means aligning benefits with the KPIs uh, that the organization, the objectives of the organization, so this does link back to that first pillar, aligning benefits with strategy. But it also means aligning, aligning benefits with the, not only the, the organizational performance management regime, but the HR performance management regime. So that it's, we book uh, benefits in people's objectives. So you know, we clear that um, the, the responsibility for benefits realization is recorded in people's objectives, and that we recognize uh, performance in our reward recognition uh, um, practices. Uh, but that we manage benefits from a portfolio perspective. I've already said, you know, in my view, as I said to the APM portfolio management SIG yesterday, uh, benefits are the answer to the portfolio question, but similarly, portfolio is the answer to the benefits question. Because it, you know, we, if we apply this regime to one or two or three or four programs, that's great, but we still face the problem of inconsistent approaches and inability to see how we're performing overall, problems of double counting, uh, and it's, in, it's inefficient. If we want a, an effective approach and an efficient approach, then we have to apply benefits at a, from a portfolio perspective uh, so we can see across the entire portfolio. Portfolio just meaning collection, our collection of our change initiatives. Uh, applying effective governance. Governance is absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, We have a section of our effective governance and then uh, uh, developing a value culture. So this is the behaviors, the governance and behaviors that underpin effective benefits management. Those two themes run right across the the guide um, more generally. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. And now we actually see, when I talked about the cycle, you can actually see the, the diagram there, which is actually uh, in the form of a cycle, so identify and quantify, value and appraise, plan, realize and review, but this got ongoing throughout the business change life cycle, revisiting each of these stages. Uh, um, the other point to make there is that the, the, the operation of this cycle needs to be set in the wider business context, and in particular, the strategic and business planning um, uh, activity, uh, these kind of investment appraisal of the uh, project and program management and the, and the uh, business as usual, so that we find ways in which the, the, the change is properly embedded so the benefits are realized. So what we're saying is it's not a special, well, so rather it is a specialism. On the other hand, it needs to be embedded within the business. Um, We've said it's a multidisciplinary practice. What we've sought to do in the guide is build on all that other stuff I mentioned earlier. We haven't just forgotten it. What we've done is we've taken the existing OGC uh, best management practice. We've taken the uh, cabinet office best management practice these days. We've taken MOV, MOP, and in particular MSP, and we've extracted all the, the references to benefits, all the coverage of benefits, and we've woven that into a consistent framework, uh, and then uh, um, expanded on it with the evidence, with the, the, the good practice up from people like John Thorpe, John Ward, um, uh, Roger Davies, uh, Alan Fowler, Jed Simpson, straight I mentioned. Uh, all these people have kind of taken all the good practice, because there is a commonality of approach, uh, identifying where they differ, where these, these authors and, and sources differ, 
we talk about the various approaches that they uh, they will um, suggest. So, for example, when we come to benefits mapping, we talk about the OG, the MSP approach to benefits mapping. We talk about the Cranfield approach to benefits dependency networks. We talk about the John Thorpe work on um, the results chain, uh, and so on and so forth. So we give you we give the reader. Uh, uh, an overview of the various approaches adopted and when each is applicable. Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the um, of these various approaches? Having said that, all of that, what we're saying also is that we're looking beyond the project and program management environment. We're looking to learn, looking at insights and learnings from a wide range of the other disciplines: management accounting, behavioral finance, psychology, uh, neuroscience, change management, and systems thinking. Looking at the um, We've got a section, uh, major section of the guide about behavioral change. We're saying you know you only get the ben quite often we'll only get uh, benefits if business change is delivered. But beyond that, we need to achieve behavioral change. And so, uh, looking to uh, to, uh, to tap into some of the uh, most recent research in psychology and neuroscience about how we achieve uh, behavioral change. And I say behavioral finance uh, links in there as well. So building on MSP, MOV, MOP, and P3O, absolutely taking the best of the best from whether that's from um, Gerald Bradley, John Thorpe, John Ward, or the OTC guidance, let's build on that. Um, applying the lessons learned from a wide variety of disciplines um, so that we achieve both this business change and behavioral change. That's what makes actually what makes the guide the, uh, the size it is. It's a large guide. It's uh, MSP size rather than. Uh, and uh, MOP science, so we're up to uh, approaching 300 pages. Um, that's what makes it uh, that size, but it, what, what makes it interesting? It makes it actually, actually a challenging world, as we've seen. Uh, I think mean, someone said, you know, benefits management isn't that difficult. Well, it isn't that difficult if you get the basics right. Unfortunately, as we've seen, many organizations struggle to make it a success uh, in reality. So, uh, but this is what I think uh, makes the, the guide uh, uh, such a good read. Okay, good. well, personal view, of course. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Next slide. And what underpins this, as, as I've talked about the principles, what we're saying though, that practice needs to be characterized by these, uh, these, these following factors. It needs to be active. Um, it needs to be evidence-based. It needs to be transparent. Uh, the, the operation of benefits management needs to be benefits-led itself. Uh, you know, we don't focus on uh, the activity that we, des that we think leads to benefits. We should actually be saying, okay, what benefits do we want to achieve, and then designing our process accordingly. Uh, it needs to be forward-looking. Rather, it's not about backward-looking, passive tracking against the forecast in a business case. It's about forward-looking. It's about insight. It's about learning. Uh, and it needs to be managed right across that business change life cycle. So it's not something that's done after implementation or you know, up front in the business case. It's done throughout. So those are the key success characteristics. Uh, and kind of sum it all up. You know, what we see in practice, unfortunately, is we see optimism over-optimism in the planning, in the business case, people are over-optimistic in what can be achieved. And then we see pessimism as people kind of track against that forecast. And I, I talk to my uh, benefit manager colleagues, and they say, you know, oh, it's terrible. You know, the benefits go down, down, down. Well, well, no, they don't have to. We need to be realistic in the planning, and we need to be enthusiastic in the delivery, finding ways to, uh, to identify benefits in active process, getting off our backsides, ongoing participative stakeholder engagement, forward-looking perspective, as I say, based on transparency, insight, learning, and continuous improvement. Um, as I said to the guys at the APM yesterday, I asked the question, what happens on projects and programs? What happens to costs? And they say the costs go up. And I say, what happens to benefits? And they say the benefits go down. And that's not a law of physics. It's not ordained by, by God. It's not in the Bible. It happens because we allow it to happen. We've got to kind of challenge that. So we need to be realistic in our planning. We need to be nailed down. Our forecast, forecasts need to be realistic. But when it comes to our targets, for example, when we come to delivery, when we're trying to incentivize people, we want uh, targets that are aspirational. We want people to reach for the stars. Um, we want to, why shouldn't we exceed forecast? Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't. OK, great. Thanks, Mark. I mentioned we, and so we use uh, this, this guidance. We've got a, we've got some uh, case studies and examples uh, from around the world, and we use techniques from around the world. Uh, working clockwise, we have I mentioned the investment logic mapping approach from Victoria in Australia, where they say you know before we write the business case, we have a workshop. Works. The issue number one is what's the problem we're trying to solve. Just working left to right. If we solve the problem, what would the benefits be? And only then do they say what should the solution be. The solution is designed 
to deliver the benefits. And then we get the guys to write the business case. When we're clear, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Even Structure Australia say that when people come to, come to them for funding, if the team can't answer the question, what's the problem you're trying to solve, they're asked to leave the room. Um, so before we have the business case, what's the problem we're trying to solve there? Uh, the, on the top right hand side, this is an example of, I mentioned the service uh, value, uh, sorry, the service profit chain. This is the example from uh, the Harvard Business Review. This is a uh, work by Heskett uh, and his colleagues from Harvard uh, trying to unpick the business model uh, that underpins uh, the delivery value in service industries in, in the private sector. Um, and this actually is a, a generic, in effect, a generic, uh, what uh, Captain Norton referred to as a generic balance scorecard. There's links here to the balance scorecard. But for example, Taco Bell are uh, one company, Sears is another company that uses it. Uh, they obviously desire that has to, this has to be tailored to the particular circumstances. But what they're able to do is, Taco Bell know, for example, that their, their restaurants that have the highest staff turnover have the lowest profitability. So they know that if they invest in staff retention, it has, oops, the phone, it has an impact on the, the bottom line in terms of productivity, uh, profitability. So they, aren't, they don't invest in employee engagement employee retention because it's a nice thing to do. They invest in it because they can see the impact that has on external service value and in terms on customer satisfaction and in terms on customer loyalty and in terms in turn on profitability. Moving downwards, we have then an uh, example of the use of graphical formats for uh, benefit reporting. This example from Western Australia, from the police of Western Australia, uh, the bottom, uh, bottom left-hand column uh, is the uh, benefits dependency network. Uh, from Cranfields, an example of benefits mapping. But I say we, you know, we have also the, uh, the investment logic mapping approach from uh, Victoria above, which is kind of uh, very similar, but the other way around. Um, we also use results chain from uh, John Thorpe from, from Fujitsu uh, and the uh, MSP approach as well. So we're giving people more than one approach uh, to the, these, the various problems they, they, they might face, descriptions and guides of how to use them. And in the middle there, we have, this is an example, triple, triple V program uh, from, uh, from Tetra Pak, um, at where they use, this example, I'm talking about behavioral change, a way of engaging people, using cartoons, for example, and videos and, uh, and stories, what's called narrative leadership, to engage people in the mutual exploration of what might be um, a way of, it's not a case of forecasting benefits up front and tracking and see whether they've been realized. It's a way of engaging people in the pursuit of value, in the generation of, of benefits. Again, that's what makes it so exciting and so much fun. This is not about passive tracking. Uh, this is about active engagement. Thanks, Mark. And I mentioned in the whole series of techniques, we talk about driver-based and understand what drives our strategic objectives, the achievement of our strategic objectives. And this is, of course, these are often based upon assumptions. So again, it's important that we use the benefits management cycle then to provide the data that determines whether our assumptions and our driver-based models were accurate. So it's part of that feedback loop, part of the learning. You know, we, we, we make the investments believing that A leads to B. We then need to kind of check that A did, uh, that did it lead to B. We talk about benefits mapping, the best approaches. What we call a dog that didn't bark test. This is from Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle. Um, too often, we, uh, we kind of, uh, we, when we evaluate a business case, we look at the benefits that are there. We don't ask the question what other benefits are, are also there. So, say, what's called the dog that didn't bark test, asking, I have all benefits been identified, because our job isn't just to hit the herd rate of return then stop. If we're investing taxpayers' money, if we're investing shareholders' money, our job is to optimize the return, to maximize the, the benefits that we realize for the, the effort put in. pre as I mentioned, conversion ratios, reference class forecasts, and this is from both Kenneman, Professor Kenneman and Professor Volupia, um, uh, argue for reference class forecasting. Um, you can read about this in, in the guide. It's what's called ethnography from Bob Cooper in Canada, a way of get a really engaging uh, with users not just sending out surveys, but actually going and living with the customer, living with the user, seeing how they, what their needs really are. Training something we took here on the right hand side about booking the benefits, the DLP technique, and scan, yeah, in terms of the scout of business idea, this is not just about the planned benefits, it's about the unplanned or what we call emergent benefits. And so one way that you can, you can identify the emergent benefits is by what we call scout and beacon. This is borrowed from uh, Andrew and Sirkin. So again, another example where we are uh, taking good ideas from various disciplines where the Andrew and Sirkin talk about having scouts who so send people out to go and look for the emergent benefits 
but at the same time you like beacons which tell people we want to know about this stuff. We, and uh, the example being that we um, we included in the Tell Us Once uh, uh, benefit report a section for unplanned benefits as well as for reporting of the planned benefits. And if that section was empty, the question is obviously asked: on, Why are you really saying there are no unanticipated benefits anywhere, uh, or is it a case we haven't captured them? So. Uh, insight via a rich picture. So we look at benefits realization from more than one perspective. We're not talking about just uh, one measure. We're talking about measures, indicators, leading and lagging measures, proxy indicators, evidence events, stories, surveys. We're trying to look at evidence from from more uh, benefits, uh, uh, evidence of benefits realization from more than one perspective. And then going into this whole issue of narrative leadership uh, and what John Thorpe talks about as activist accountability. This concept the buck doesn't stop here. The buck starts here. We want people to, you know, we hold ourselves to account. We aren't uh, held to account by uh, by an external uh, external force. We ourselves should be holding ourselves to account for for benefits realisation. Thanks, Mark. And I say uh, practical examples from around the world. Uh, big thanks to Paul Aragoni from Bristol City Council. A lot of excellent stuff from there, from my good friend uh, Dr. Peter Rothick in Germany, from the WEVI framework. Um, many frameworks have been designed, uh, I should say, and the guidance refers to the value measuring methodology as well from the US, uh, demand and value assessment methodology from Australia. So we've got lots of guidance or frameworks for, for benefits. Usually these frameworks aren't uh, applied on an ongoing basis or a, uh, uh, for over a number of years. Germany would be one of the uh, exceptions to that. They've been uh, uh, the, the Weeby framework has been quite successful in that in, in that regard. Uh, from text back, I mentioned the open reach. Many thanks to Sarah Harris for and Jim Runnicles for the case studies they provided from NASA, from the Obayashi Corporation Japan, Western Australia Police Tell Us Once program in the UK, and a whole load of others. That's just uh, uh, some examples there. Um, okay, great, great. Thanks, Mark. And this chart basically, this is from the back of the guide, but this is a benefits map. For or benefits, what we call benefits logic map, it's benefits law, for benefits management itself. And what this is here is saying, rather than starting on the right hand side, um, trying to decide what we should do, you start in the middle. Start with what we want to achieve. Start with the benefits, the end benefits, and then the intermediate benefits, and work back. That determines what we should do. Too often, people I can say get fixated on the on the stuff rather than what the stuff's intended to achieve. So focus on what you want to achieve and work backwards uh, from there. So we say benefits management itself should be benefits-led. It's not an activity. The Harbour Business Review um, article that we refer to throughout the guide talks about this difference between activity-centered programs and results-led programs or benefits-led programs. Too often, this stuff, it all kind of makes sense, except if it's activity-based, it doesn't stack to get stack up. People aren't focused on the benefits. We should start with the end in mind, start with the benefits that we want to achieve. Thanks, Mark. The review group there, you can see, is listed a fairly wide review group. The, uh, this means these people crawled all over their various drafts and contributed uh, extensively. So we have the representatives from the best management practice community, including the cabinet office, and then the authors of the, the most relevant guidance, um, some uh, leading benefits management practitioners, and uh, representatives from the APM benefits management SIG in particular. And then the uh, APMG assessors and ACOs and ATO community worldwide with European, Australian, South American, uh, input uh, as well as from here from Patrick Mayfield uh, and many thanks to uh, say to, to those guys for their for their input the guide uh, reflects their input throughout thanks Mark where have we got to well the guide was published it was uh, I think officially available from last week from last Tuesday the launch event in London where we actually had a, a rainbow once I finished a rainbow appeared uh, I'm not making it up I can send the photographs we have a we had a rainbow across London the executive guide, uh, as with MOP, uh, we produce the main guide and then an executive guide, a small ex uh, executive guide. That executive guide, um, uh, the f first draft I delivered to my APMG colleagues last night. That hopefully will be published. Uh, by, it takes longer to publish these things than it does to write them, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but we, the aim is to have that out by Christmas. Uh, webinars, this is the first of the webinars for Europe. We have, uh, it says October the 18th, actually it's October the 17th, I believe, uh, for Australia and New Zealand. And uh, for North America, we are still uh, looking at various dates. Yeah, I presented at uh, three showcases today, London, Brisbane, and Frankfurt. Frankfurt last Friday, the most recent one. Uh, Sweden, uh, I think, is the next one. Gothenburg, uh, I'll be presenting at on November 
the 23rd. Any Swedish people on the call? Yep. Uh, Gothenburg on uh, the 23rd of uh, November. I've been speaking to uh, the APM uh, branch and SIG events. I uh, mentioned the, the one I did yesterday. I've got another one on November the 9th in Leeds. And one on November the 22nd. Anyone who's in London, it's a, it's a free event, I believe, uh, for the, um, or at least for APM members, it's, it's free. I um, think £10 for, for non-members. That's for the uh, APM PMO and Benefits Management 6, a joint event, November 22nd uh, in London, an evening event. Uh, a repository on, on site, hopefully we'll have that fairly soon. Uh, trainer training events have completed in Amsterdam, London, and Brisbane. That's all been done. Um, so the trainer's in position. The foundation exams are, are ready to go. Um, uh, and uh, the practitioner exams, uh, we've just commenced work on those exams now. The plan is to be live with the practitioner exams uh, next February. Thanks, Mark. And um, I'm happy to take questions and answers. Well, have, sorry, happy to take questions and hopefully volunteer answers. <laughs> yeah, we've not had many in so far. We'll give it a couple of minute, more minutes because I'm sure now that you've uh, finished, Steve, there'll be a few more questions coming in. Um, one question we did get is when, was, when is the, um, the guide available? Um, well, that is, is actually available now. Um, yeah. You can get that from our, um, our online bookstore, uh, which is www apmg-businessbooks.com or if uh, if you just go into a Google search and put APMG Business Books in, um, that will come up at the uh, at either at the top or very close to the top. Um, and that's uh, it's fifty fifty pounds, I believe, is the is the uh, the price for a copy. I think uh, that's the that's the kind of pricing that um, is consistent with all the OGC stuff, isn't it? The the various guidance and it's been, actually it's been published that it's published by TSO. It's very much in that style, uh, the two-column format, the, the shades of blue. Um, I think it's always, can I mention it's on Amazon as well, Mark? Um, yeah, I believe it is, yeah. I'm <laughs> sure I've seen it on there. Amazon, and was, I think if anyone's on the TSO site, it's on the TSO site as well. TSO set them off, the, off that side as well. Um, there is a, uh, a benefits manager, oh, managing benefits community of interest that we've established, and I would encourage everyone to to join that if you haven't done so already. I think we have on the, the next slide, have we marked the, um, the address of that, that group? Yep, that's on screen. Yeah, there yeah. it is. The, uh, in the middle there um, is this uh, community of interest. And the idea of having this community of interest is some, it's a place that people can come to for uh, updates, so all the, the various webinars, the talks, uh, the articles that we're running, a whole series of articles around the guidance as well. Those articles, the links to those articles will be posted on that LinkedIn community of interest as well. So I think we have about uh, approaching 500 members at the moment, which is not bad given that we, only, we didn't have an exam uh, or, or guide until, uh, until last week. So um, that, um, that, that, that community is growing rapidly. So the, uh, that's something I'll encourage everyone to, who's on the call to, to sign up to. It's free to join. Uh, it's just a way of... Uh, of um, of staying up to date and a way of posting comments and uh, questions if you've got a question. Uh, if you need, want to contact me uh, uh, directly, my email is there. Please feel free to contact me. Uh, always willing to have a debate, as I said to the guys last week or yesterday. Anything up to five emails a day is fine. Uh, anything more than five emails, that's not that's uh, that's stalking. That's a criminal offence, and uh, you'll be referred to uh, the the appropriate authorities. But no, I'm more than happy to. Um, to, to take, uh, take questions uh, uh, privately if people want to uh, contact me directly. Steve, in reference to the uh, rep repository, you mentioned we've um, had a query from Guy, just wondering um, what sort of resources will be in that, do you think? And okay, well, the idea, I mean, the, the idea there is I, I, when I talk to people they, on P3O, they say they, you know, they actually quite like the uh, repository that they had on P3O. The only downside of it was that the, uh, you had to download the whole thing rather than you couldn't go on and uh, extract individual items, apparently. Um, so the idea is, I mean, initially what we're going to do is we're going to put on that repository, you'll be free to download, it'll be various um, templates from uh, from the guide itself. So the first thing will be the, the various, I say there's a health check, uh, for example, there's a 10-question a, a health check uh, that we include at the back of the guide. So that would go on the repository, so you can download that uh, and kind of do, do a, kind of a very quick health check. You ask some senior managers to, to, to fill out the questionnaire, just 10 questions, 10 basic questions, and you can use that to assess where you are, and it leads then to do, you know, if you're weak in a certain area, it talks about the issues that you need to consider. Uh, so there is that. Uh, there is a, uh, a log, a skills log and competence
dependencies log. Uh, so that, again, we would look to put in a repository. Um, and there are a couple of other, there's the, the benefits map I just referred to, I think we've put that benefits map on. There's a couple of other things that, um, that are included in the guide. So the very, um, uh, that sort of documentation we, 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 we will put on the repository. Um, the second uh, category is, uh, of the things I want to put on the repository are these articles that I referred to. There's already a link on the APMG website to uh, an article that I had published uh, in the uh, PM World Journal. Uh, if anyone, if you go onto the APMG site there, go on to the benefits management bit, you should be able to get a copy of that article. If you can't get the link to that article, just email me and I can, I'll send you the, send you the article. Um, so that was an article about uh, building solid foundations um, for, for benefits management. So again, based upon, the idea is we, what we want to do, well, what I want to do, that was the first article, with the, 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 the next few, uh, I've just drafted the next one, which Mark has currently, and I think Mark is kind of uh, uh, converting that to, uh, an AP, uh, to an official looking format, and that will go on the website. That's about, um, I wrote uh, implications, uh, Patrick Mayfield referred me to some work by Margaret Wheatley on, uh, on the impact for leadership of um, you know, new science, quantum physics, chaos theory, that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's some I, I read the book and there were some interesting uh, uh, parallels there to some of the things we were talking about in managing benefits. So I've done an article on that. Uh, now the idea with the next series of articles is that we take a theme of the guide, some text and uh, an extract from the guide, and then I, I uh, co-author with someone else uh, who then we kind of say, that's great, and this is what we've done elsewhere. So you actually get some more uh, practical examples from beyond uh, managing benefits. So the idea is that we can produce a series of articles, perhaps one a month, and we'll put these up on the uh, on the repository. So initially, it's the, the, uh, the forms from the guide. That will then be followed by the, the articles. And then the, the third category is an idea I have of actually looking to develop some uh, document templates uh, using benefit profile, benefits realization, benefits management strategy, developing some templates that we can put there, again, that people can then download uh, and use and hopefully come back with some ideas. I want to use the community of interest in developing these, these templates as well. It's not something I kind of sit in my every tower uh, developing a, a template, I'd rather that we, we get um, uh, a wide variety of practitioners involved in the development of these, these templates. Thanks, Steve. Um, interesting one from Amar who asked, does the guy cover the skills needed to realise benefits with a tool for measuring each skill type? Well, there we go. Yeah, I'd say there is, there is a skills absolute. I mean, the, you know, you know, anyways, I mean, skills is important, competence is important, uh, attitude, motivation is important, uh, tools and techniques are important. You know, all these things are, are crucial. And I'd say we include uh, a skills and, competence, skills and competencies log uh, at the, in the dependencies, which kind of goes through the various um, areas of, of the guide and then says in terms of, I mean, this is something each organization has to decide for themselves because clearly, depending upon your role, uh, you need to have more uh, developed skills in certain areas. But what we're saying is right across the, the, the piece, it's important that people kind of have at least an awareness, a basic understanding of, you know, what's, what's uh, required uh, throughout cycle at the various uh, practices and uh, also understand the principles and how how to apply them to uh, how to apply the various techniques so yeah I mean the um, and, and clearly what we say uh, in the guide I mean the guide supports the exams uh, the accredited exams and these exams uh, follow the usual uh, APMG uh, uh, format you know with print uh, MSP uh, MOV MOP all that kind of stuff MOR um, so we have practice uh, foundation exams and very soon we'll have practitioner exams. Uh, the practitioner exam being a uh, three-hour exam, the uh, foundation just is the, the, the much easier, uh, four, a 40-minute, um, both using the OTE format. So anyone that's sat M MSP or Prince or MOP or sorry, uh, SAN, if the MOR, uh, change management will understand the, 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 um, the approach. But what we say in the guide also is that tr whilst training is important, uh, and an awareness of the guide is important, you know, it's, it's application that matters. And so what's crucial there we find that is you know, ongoing engagement, ongoing coaching actually adds uh, uh, enormous value. And so that, that's part of the idea of this community of interest. It's a way of, where people can maintain that interest going forward, ask questions, enhance their knowledge on an active basis. Great, thanks Steve. Um, a couple of training related queries as well. Um, Simon's asked um, what duration is anticipated for the training course. Um, is it practical okay. to offer a four day course plus the exams on a fifth day? Um, my understanding that it is, is that is the anticipated format. Um, Steve, you obviously correct yeah, me. I, mean, I, I think you know, in my, my view on this, you know, 
what we have is a guide. Uh, my job then is to uh, to write the exams with a, a, an exam team uh, and to develop the examination, the syllabus, and design documents and so on for the exam, which is what I'm doing. Um, I also, as part of it, have to develop some vanilla training materials uh, for the uh, training providers, and they then adapt that training material and design their own courses. Now, in many ways, I think, well, the design, the length of the course, and how they provide the course is up to each training provider, um, depending upon their market knowledge. And I'm aware that the, the market needs uh, vary quite uh, significantly uh, between uh, the UK market, for example, the Dutch market is somewhat different, and the Australian market, again, is, is somewhat different. Having said that, there was some uh, pressure to actually include an indicative a schedule. So it is very much the indicative schedule is very much um, as with the the, the other uh, o, uh, the other uh, products, the OGC products uh, that APMG uh, set exams for. And so the idea is normally a foundation would be two to three days, included the exam. The practitioner exam would be the five day. Uh, that's not say it has to be five days, but the five days in, including uh, including the exam. Remembering this is a, that's a three-hour exam. Oh, sorry, no, three, two and a half. Sorry, to correct myself. There, it's two, the plan is it will be a two and a half-hour exam. Yeah. And the and the practitioner format-wise is the um, uh, objective testing, complex multiple choice. Yeah, that, that's right. Objective testing format is exactly the same. Uh, the format would be the uh, it, uh, APMG have three approved formats now. It's going to be, uh, for example, it's slightly different. From MOP MOP, for example, is four twenty-mark questions. Um, this will be eight, ten mark questions. So, uh, and the structure we see is you've, you've got five practices there: um, identify and quantify, value and appraise, plan, realize and review. So that's five practices. Each of those has a ten mark question. Uh, there's a ten mark question on principles. There's a ten mark question on a portfolio level approach, and a ten mark question on implement and uh, implementing, sustaining, and measuring uh, progress. So, uh, and those ten uh, ten marks are split up into into sub questions. So. Uh, anything from two marks up to up to up to five or six marks. So um, yeah, that's the format, OTE format. Uh, the usual t uh, question uh, style uh, that people will have sat in in prints and MSB and MOR and MOP and so forth. That's great, thanks, Steve. Uh, and just one more question, I think, before we wrap up. Um, just alluding to the uh, the. I hope I don't put you on the spot here a bit, Steve. But what would you say to those who? Um, Perhaps question the value of another examination. You know, for this for this course, what would you say the value is in the exam for for those sitting there? Well, as I said at the beginning, you know, what <laughs> this isn't about delivering. If you, don't, if you deliver the program and it doesn't deliver the benefits, what you know, what was the point? If you deliver a project and it doesn't deliver the benefit, what was the point? The whole point here is that I mean, even if the benefits are there and we're unable to demonstrate them, which is often the case, it has to be said, it's not a case that the benefits aren't there. It's just we can't demonstrate them. On the other hand, if you can't do that then in the world in which we live, it is a competitive world for funding. And increasingly, funding agencies, shareholders, the city, are looking for evidence that people can actually dem deliver on their promises. Um, and therefore, it's, you know, it is so important that we're able to demonstrate uh, the benefits are realized. So I would say, first of all, you know, there's, that, there's that argument um, that it's the, it's the right thing to do, it, uh, which it is. You know, the reason we invest in project programs is to realize benefits. Secondly, I'd say there is the very real issue that if we don't realize the benefits, then you know future funding and therefore few people's future employment uh, is, is put at risk. But thirdly, I would say there is nothing more, you know, more challenging and therefore more exciting and more fun than actually doing this properly. The big mistake people make is where they kind of look at this as a dull, you know, it's a write a business case, then track and make sure you kind of do the minimum and um, and see if the benefits have actually been realized and, and come no one takes it in. Seriously, this is about you know getting off your back. So it's about you know applying the lessons of a whole wide range of disciplines. It is actually really fun. It's really exciting. It's a, just a really interesting field. And I, I just think it's a wonderful thing. And I have to say, as I go around and as I talk to people worldwide, that you know the message I get is that people are really up for this stuff. You know, we the benefits management SIG of the uh, APM, for example, is or was or still is the fastest growing SIG, uh, especially in script they've had. Uh, the, 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 the attendance at the sessions I've been doing in Australia is been overwhelming. The feedback which had in Australia was overwhelming. Uh, the the uh, same in Amsterdam. So there is a there is a I think a very strong recognition. There is a latent demand uh, for this that it does fill uh, a gap. Uh, you know, is this is the guide the complete answer? No. You know, is the training the complete answer? No. You have to apply this stuff. This, but it's a step in the right direction.
Uh, I, you know, I'm really pleased with God. I'm really excited by it. Hopefully, exams will will uh, will be uh, equally successful. Uh, but it's about then about applying it, and that again is about then people joining this community of interest. So they're able to develop the skills and apply their skills. Excellent. Thanks very much, Steve. As I say, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. We are, I'm conscious there are uh, one or two other questions that we maybe didn't get to there. Um, but well, we... yeah, I Mark, my email was on that slide. My email yeah. is there. If I didn't answer anyone's question, I can't see that. Mark can see the questions. I can't. Please just kind of uh, email me your question, and I'm more than happy to, to respond to you. Yeah, and, and, and we have a full record of all the questions that were submitted during the session as well. So one way or another, either directly or indirectly, we'll make sure those are um, addressed. Um, so it leads me to say thank you for um, attending today. We do hope you found it useful and um, no doubt you've got a good introduction there from Steve on the new guide. Um, and obviously there's the links on screen there if you want to find out any, any further information. And as I said, towards the start of the session we will be putting a copy of the slides and a recording on our website and we'll let you all know when that's available. Um, yeah, so thanks again for attending and um, thank you very much Steve for your time and, and for the My overview. Pleasure. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers.